Okay, well, this is not going to be a deep um, historical study or anything. I'm going to use this book as a kind of, I'm going to present bits of it and use it as a kind of a springboard for some of my current thoughts. So in some sense, this isn't very systematic, but it's trying to just get some ideas across. And the big issue is, what is the nature of the physical world? How can it be that it underlies our existence? And what is the nature of our physical existence? These were the sort of themes which were in this book. And at least, and the whole point is, when you start asking these questions, what's the nature of physical existence? It leads to very practical understanding, such as the nature and importance of the chemical elements. Uh, but it also gives to crucial philosophical understanding about our own nature, what we're made of, how we function, and how we came into being. And there are these two different sides which come into it. And these studies underline um, musings on the nature of existence and the meaning of life. And Eddington was very philosophical, but also, of course, he did very detailed calculations, first in astrophysics, and I must just comment on that. He really was one of the founding fathers of astrophysics, particularly stellar structure. His book on stellar structure is a wonderful book. Information and interaction are central to it. So the, the great text is The Nature of the Physical World. It's his 1926-1927 Gifford Lectures, published in 28, and you can download a complete version of it off the web. And of course, Eddington is one of the people who helped make Einstein famous through his um, eclipse expedition. In a sense, it was really that eclipse expedition which really propelled Einstein to being world famous. So this book is based on Eddington's Gifford Lectures, given in Edinburgh. Although it's, it was written a long time ago, it remains a classic on the nature and implications of science. I think it's still worth reading. It's not up to date on many things, nuclear reactions, the standard model particle physics, cosmology, but it's very useful on the foundations and the nature physics, including the nature statistical physics, relativity theory, quantum theory. And it's still <coughs> worth reading as a meditation on the nature of scientific enterprise, what we can learn from science about the nature of things, and how this contrasts with what we perceive in daily life. In a sense, that's a really interesting thing. The contrast between the scientific understanding and daily life. That's the kind of interesting thing. This is a book review by Donald Mansell, The Nature of the Physical World. Eddington's The Nature of the Physical World is one of the most interesting and stimulating books that's ever been my privilege to read. In its characteristically lucid way with metaphor and analogy, Eddington attempts to bridge the precarious gulf that lies between physics and philosophy. Okay, so what we want to understand is how does physics underlie all of these everyday things and what's the relation between them? How do relativity theory, quantum theory, prison day cosmology change our views of the world and the universe and how everyday life? Now, I'm going to read some passages from it because some of you won't have read this, some of you will, but I just love the writing and I'm going to read them in any case. I've settled down to the task of writing these lectures and I've drawn up my chairs to my two tables. Two tables, yes, there are duplicates of every object about me. Two tables, two chairs, two pens. This is not a very profound beginning to a course which ought to reach transcendental levels of scientific philosophy, but we cannot touch bedrock immediately. We must scratch a bit at the surface of things first. And whenever I begin to scratch, the first things I strike is my two tables. One of them has been familiar to me from my earliest years. It is a commonplace object of that environment which I call the world. How shall I describe it? It has extension, it, has comparatively perm it is comparatively permanent, it is coloured, above all it is substantial. By substantial, I do not merely mean that it does not collapse when I lean upon it, I mean it is constituted of a substance. By that word I'm trying to convey to you some conception of its intrinsic nature. It is a thing, not like space which is a mere negation, nor like time which is heaven knows what. But that will not help you <laughs> My, that will not help you to my meaning because it is the distinctive characteristic of a thing to have the substantiality. And I do not think substantiality can be described better than by saying it is the kind of nature exemplified by an ordinary table. And so we go round in circles. Table number two is my scientific table. It is more recent acquaintance and I do not feel so familiar with it. It does not belong to the world previously mentioned. That world which spontaneously appears around me when I open my eyes. Now, how, how much of it is objective and how much is subjective, I do not here consider. It is part of a world which in more obvious ways has forced itself on my attention. My scientific table is mostly emptiness. Sparsely scattered in that emptiness are numerous electric charges rushing about with great speed, but their combined bulk amounts to less than a billionth of the bulk of the table itself. 
Notwithstanding its strained construction, it turns out to be an entirely efficient table. It supports my writing paper as satisfactorily as table number one. For when I lay the paper on it, the little electric particles with their headlong speed keep on hitting the underside, so the paper is maintained in shuttlecock fashion at a nearly steady level. If I lean upon this table, I shall not go through. Or to be strictly, strictly accurate, the chance of my scientific elbow going through my scientific table is so excessively small that it can be neglected in practical life. There is nothing substantial about my second table. It's nearly all empty space, space pervaded, it is true, by fields of force, but these are assigned to the category of influences, not of things. Even in the minute part which is not empty, we must not transfer the old motion of substance. In the second matter into electrical charges, we've traveled far from that picture of it which first gave rise to the concept of substance, and the meaning of that conception, if it ever had any, has been lost by the way. I will not here stress the the non-substantiality of electrons, since it is scarcely necessary to the present line of thought. Conceive them as substantially as you will, there's a vast difference between my scientific table with the substance of any thinly scattered in specks in a region mostly empty, and the table of everyday conception which we regard as the type of solid reality. It makes all the difference in the world whether the table before me is poised as it were on a swarm of flies and sustained in shuttlecock fashion by a series of tiny blows from the swarm underneath, or whether it is supported because there is substance below it, it being the intrinsic nature of substance to occupy space to the occlusion of other substances. All the difference in conception at least, but no difference to my practical task of writing on the paper. When we compare the universe as it is now supposed to be with the universe as we have ordinarily preconceived it, the most arresting thing is not the rearrangement of space and time by Einstein, but the dissolution of all that we regarded as the most solid into tiny specks floating in the void. That gives an abrupt jar to those who think that things are more or less what they seem. The revelation of the physics of the void within the atom is more disturbing than the revelation by astronomy of the imminent, immense voids of interstellar space, as the atom is as porous as the solar system. In 1911, Rutherford showed that the positive electricity was also concentrated into tiny specks. His scattering experiments proved that the atom was able to exert large electric forces which would be impossible unless the positive charges acted as highly concentrated sources of attraction that must be contained in a nucleus minute in comparison with the dimension of the atom. Thus, for the first time, the main volume of the atom was entirely evacuated, and a solar system type of atom was substituted for a substantial billiard ball. If we eliminated all the unfilled spaces in a man's body and collected the protons and electrons into one mass, the man would be reduced to a speck of size just visible with a magnifying glass, and so on. I need not tell you that modern physics has, by delicate test and remorseless logic, assured me that my second scientific table is the only one which is really there, wherever there may be. On the other hand, I need not tell you that modern physics will never succeed in exorcising that first table, the strange <coughs> compound of external nature, mental imagery, and inherited prejudice, which lies invisible to, visible to my eyes and tangible to my grasp. Science aims at constructing a world which shall be symbolic of the world of commonplace experience. The external world of physics has thus become a world of shadows. In removing our illusions, we have removed the substance, for indeed we have seen the substance as one of the greatest of our illusions. Later, perhaps, we may inquire whether in our zeal to cut out all that is unreal, we may have not used the knife too ruthlessly. Perhaps, indeed, reality is the child which cannot survive without its nurse illusion. But if so, that is a little concern to the scientist who has good and sufficient reasons for pursuing his investigation <coughs> in the world of shadows and is content to leave to the philosopher the determination of his exact status in regard to reality. So, I've read you a rather extended passage, because I think that writing is absolutely so wonderful. Okay. So what I want to pick up is some of the great ideas from physical science and beyond that are in this book, and then what's happening today. So the first great idea which was emphasized there is testable physical laws. There's a law like behavior of matter and energy that underlies our existence. It's best expressed in mathematical work models. The way that these work, the, the, the way that the, the, the matter works and these laws behave can only be determined by physical experiment and is often completely unexpected. This gives an extraordinary understanding of the physical world, but these laws are abstract and symbolic and they omit much of reality. I'll come back to that later on. And one of the wonderful passages here, one of the laws he emphasizes, is the second law, which relates to the discussion of time we've had earlier. 
Shuffling is the only thing which nature cannot undo. If you take a pack of cards as it comes from the maker and shuffle it for a few minutes, all trace of the original systematic order disappears. The order will never come back however long you shuffle. Something has been, be, has been done which cannot be undone, namely the introduction of a random element in place of arrangements. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equation, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. If it is found to be contradicted by observations, well, experimentalists do bundle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There's nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. <laughs> okay, and I love that discussion, his wonderful discussion of the second law and its foundations. Now, what is relevant today, this test of physical laws, is there a group of particle physicists and cosmologists who at the present time are trying to dilute this principle. They want to downgrade the requirement of testability because they want us to believe their untestable theories are scientific. Sean Carroll has written about this recently in a blog and in a paper of his. And for instance, we mentioned this morning he has this theory about the direction of time being symmetric and there's a universe part below in the other side of this bounce, which Hugh Price talked about. And time works this way and this part and this way. Now this is a wonderful kind of speculation. But is it scientifically testable and the answer is no. If it is not testable, the question for us is, is it science? And there's a group of people, and Sean is particularly one of them who's emphasizing this, saying, basically saying our theories are so good, they're so well supported by our theoretical understanding, we no longer need to carry out the tests because it's such a good theory. I think this is incredibly dangerous from the viewpoint of science. The heart of science is at stake here, the key element that's led to its astounding success over the past 300 years. And I think this is an issue which philosophers of science should take very seriously, and scientists, because actually, um, to me, this group, and there are people who want to defend the multiverse, they want to defend string theory, they want to defend holographic, this and that, all sorts of kind of stuff, which is not testable. Are they doing science or are they doing some form of philosophy or what are they doing? I think that's an interesting question. Okay, the second principle is the atomic principle. All we see around us is made of discrete units, atoms, molecules, cells and so on that interact together to give the complexity we see and experience. The vast number of constituent particles enable complex systems to arise. The reason that we can be so complex is because we're made of such incredible numbers of particles. Tend to 13 cells interacting in the body. Each cell, billions and billions of atoms. It's true in biology where they store, these particles store and process information as well as physics where statistics and quantum theory underlies all. And I think this atomic principle is absolutely fundamental. And I think that one can extend this now in quantum, phys quantum gravity ideas to apply the atomic principle to space and time to say that that principle, that foundational Atomic principle should apply also to the foundations of space and time. Space and time, too, should be quantized. And of course, there are loops in this from uh, loop, there are hints of this from loop quantum gravity and so on. My viewpoint on this is based on a philosophical foundation, a meta principle, which I get from David Hilbert that there should be in physics no physically existing infinities. Now, I know that this is very unpopular with some physicists to say this. But the point about infinity, infinity in my view is not being taken seriously by physicists nowadays. People toss around the word infinity as if it's an everyday thing, just an ordinary old number, it's a very big number. Infinity is not a very big number. Infinity is an entity, a quantity which cannot be attained, it is always beyond reach. It doesn't matter what you do, you never even begin to approach infinity and I think physicists have forgotten this in the way they talk about things nowadays. It's not, if I hold out my fingers, is there an uncountable number of physically distinct points between my fingers? I think it's absolute nonsense to say there is. Mathematically, you maintain that, but physically, can there be physically distinct, uncountable infinity of points? Now, if you actually think, what is physically distinguishable? Maybe I could split in physical terms down to, maybe I could split that into 10 to the 500 points. Actually, physical experiment couldn't do that, but nevertheless, supposing you could have a physical experiment that would distinguish 10 to the 500 points between my fingers. That isn't even the first step 
on the road to infinity. And that's what people have forgotten when they talk about infinity. 10 to the 500, 10 to the 500,000 million points is still not the first step of the road because infinity is always beyond what you have done. And furthermore, if you claim that there's an infinity of points between my fingers, there's this continuum, there's no experiment which can prove it to be true. Therefore, from my simple-minded position, it is not a scientific statement. Principle three, symmetries and conservation laws. Now, Eddington does not talk about this so much in his book, but this is now the foundation of a huge amount of physics. And of course, Eddington knew about the Bible and all of that, but somehow in his books, in his writing, I don't really see the symmetries. Maybe some of the Eddington experts can go back on me this. But, of course, he, uh, he knew variational principles and all of that. And in the variational principles, the symmetries of the underlying equations, there's associated conservation laws as shown by Emmy Noether in one of the most important theorems in theoretical physics. These conservation laws associated with symmetries underlie the nature of theoretical physics nowadays and the regularity of everyday life, the structures are experience. Everyday life is also based there are symmetries of various kinds. Um, identity depends on our laws of conservation. And so does the basis of an economy. So let me explain what I mean by that. Symmetries underlie conservation of matter. Now, when we identify objects, we identify objects because they remain in existence, because things can turn. So it's absolutely fundamental. This thing isn't going to vanish in half a minute from now. It's still going to be there. Why? Because of those conservation laws. Why? Because of the symmetries based. The Lagrangian, the Hamiltonian, have got these symmetries which say this thing is going to stay in existence. So symmetries underlie everyday life in that sense. The economy. Um, money is conserved. Well, not quite. <laughs> There's friction. <laughs> Goods are conserved. It's, well, it's the first and the second law combined which underlies the economy out there that energy is conserved, but useful energy decreases. Matter is conserved but useful matter decreases and so on. These laws, symmetry conservation laws, underlie the economy. Exact symmetries in theoretical physics underlie the nature of interaction. Broken symmetries, the nature of their outcomes. And we've had this wonderful link through from solid state physics where broken symmetries were found to be very important through to particle physics by Phil Anderson and through to cosmology by Alan Guth, leading to the theory of inflation and structure formation. So, in some sense, it's, it's a little bit surprising in a way that I suppose it's hidden in there in the fundamental, in his Eddington's fundamental theory, but in the writings and least in this book, the symmetries are not particularly brought up. What is implicit there is the emergence of higher level order. And um, this particulate structure, these discrete objects put together to allow higher levels of order and meaning to emerge that are independent of the lower level structures, despite being based on them. It's, it's, it's strange in a way, Eddington, he was so focused on the physical, he so, seems to have not thought very much about the emergence of biology out of physics. He missed the Schrodinger thing, Schrodinger's wonderful book, What is Life? Um, and he could have done it because he had the mind to do it. Anyhow, this is something he didn't do. Um, what you have is you've got these higher level structures, and there are equivalence class of lower level structures which will give you the uh, same higher level kind of behavior. And higher level laws govern these higher levels, and entail in particular the emergence of chemistry, biology, and crucially, the arrow of time. That's one of the examples. And the position I take together with Dennis Noble is that all of these levels are equally real. Particle physics underlies atomic physics, underlies chemistry, underlies biochemistry, cell biology, weaponry, psychology, sociology. And the question there, which he comes to with his table, and I think he's absolutely clear, is the table real or is it not real? And I think he's saying there are two tables there and they are both real tables. That table, and that is absolutely real, and the table made of the atoms is real. They are both real. Each level is real in its own right. And I strongly recommend the right things. Yeah. I just don't know. I mean, he does explicitly mention biology in philosophy, physical and science, and he thinks that it's basically it's, it's, there's no general laws. He thinks it's contingent in the <coughs> events. So there's no reduction going on. He doesn't view it like it's in a hierarchy. Well, so it would be in its other category of existence, not. Uh, okay, but he briefly mentions that there are general rules in biology. There's a whole stack of rules of various kinds. 
and they're different from the laws of physics. And I won't, but I'll mention it briefly again. I mean, he just tendentially made, mentions Darwinian selection there. But well, he gets it wrong. Okay? He gets it wrong. <laughs> he gets it wrong. So, I mean, it's interesting that he, he had a mind which could have grasped the link physics, chemistry, biology, and he didn't apply his mind to it. So, so anyhow, I take the view that all of these levels are real and that there are levels, there are laws of behavior of cell biology which are not reducible to the laws of physics, there are laws of psychology which are not reducible to the laws of cell biology, that there are emergent layers of structure, each of which has got its own levels, and they are based in the underlying stuff. There's nothing in them which contradicts the underlying stuff, but they cannot be deduced from the lower levels. Why is that? It's because context determines the outcome. And so in all of these cases, and this is something where <laughs> um, I run into trouble from people. This is an FQXI supported <laughs> project. I won the second prize in the last year's essay for my talk about top-down causation as well as what am I causation. There is top-down causation taking place, and we can have a lot of debates about this. Because context determines the outcomes. The laws of physics say what the interactions are, but the interactions lead to different outcomes depending on the context in which they are put. In other words, the context acts down to help determine the outcomes. As far as all of biology, for instance, ecology, the outcomes of how animals survive depends on an ecosystem, developmental biology, the whole of the rise of epigenetics is about what happens in developmental biology is all determined by context. It also occurs in physics, including our situation in the universe. And the classic example there, which was being mentioned, briefly mentioned, is the error of time. Many people believe comes because of a global condition at the start of the universe. At the start of the universe was very special, as Roger Penrose and others have emphasized, David Lombard has emphasized. And it is that initial condition which leads to the error of time. And so that's a global condition, maybe the universe is smooth to begin with, which leads to one of the most fundamental things locally, namely the increase of entropy in this room. So in the end, it's this cosmological context that allows us to exist. We live in a very special universe in very many ways, which I won't go into discussing here. I think Martin Rees talked about this earlier this week. And why we live in this special universe is a philosophical question, which cannot be uniquely solved by science. But so what the point I want to make is that bottom-up physically-based causation takes place all the time. Nothing I'm going to say denies that there's this bottom-up physically-based causation taking place. But in addition, the higher-level entities, including non-physical entities, such as ideas, shape the outcome of physical events at lower levels. Eddington kind of hints at this thing about the ideas having caused the power. I'll say a little bit more about this in a minute. Not all the higher-level entities, of course, are in lower-level entities. Take the case of money. I've got a piece of patent paper. Now, that piece of patent paper has got cause and power in the real world. It can create buildings, it can create um, nuclear explosions, it can create all sorts. Why does a piece of paper have cause and power? And the answer, of course, is because there is a social agreement whereby that paper does have cause and power. There's absolutely no way that physics can explain to you why a piece of money has got the powers it does. The physics can examine the structure of the atoms, they can look at the ink and the printing and all the rest of it. None of that begins to tell you why a piece of paper can buy you food or a trip down the Thames, whatever you like. So this is an example of a higher level entity, namely money, which is not a coarse grained lower level entity. High level structures function are not reducible to lower level, although they are based in them. It applies in particular to human thoughts and intentions and their realization of social conventions. Thus, physics is not all that there is that is causally effective in the real world, and Eddington was saying that, but I think it would have been helped by putting in this idea that in the hierarchy of complexity, there's top-down action as well as bottom-up action. Emergence of genuine complexity is possible because there are incidental feedback loops, and that's what enables genuine complexity <coughs> to come into existence. Now, for instance, how does this airline come into existence? It comes into existence because a group of people develop the idea of the airline, and the idea is an abstract thing. They develop it as a hierarchically structured abstract analysis, and it costs a great deal of money for them to develop that plan. You need aerodynamics engineers, systems engineers, uh, 
materials people, avionics people, and all the rest of it, and they put it together and they get an idea. That idea is not a physical thing. This is an abstract thing which is realized in people's brains, it's realized in computers, it's realized in pictures. The plan itself is none of those things. It's the abstract entity which is represented in these many different ways. And the fact that this thing exists and flies proves that brains have power, but much more than it proves that ideas, abstract ideas, have causal powers in changing what exists on the earth. I could spend a great deal of time talking about top-down action in the brain. I'll give you just one example, and we could look at some others later on if you like. But can anybody see any triangles there? Yep. There isn't any triangle on this sheet of paper. What they are are circular bits and angles. And our brain tells us there's a triangle. That's because our brain does not work in a bottom-up way. It doesn't work by the photons coming in onto the retina and that feeds through to the brain and tells you this is what we've seen out there. Your brain is telling your eye what it ought to be seeing all the time. And what you see is not what is there, it's what your brain thinks ought to be there. One of the most famous examples of that is as I look at you, there's a blank spot there. And you don't see the blank spot and I don't see the blank spot. The mind fills in what is there, there are no triangles there, and I can give you many examples from neuroscience saying you can't understand the brain, how the brain functions, unless you take top-down causation into account. Okay, now, information is garnered by adaptive selection. Eddington kind of mentions this, but in, well, at least in this one, just as a sideline. The basic process, variation, selection, and then deletion of the stuff that you don't want. This is far more general than Darwinian selection. It's the process by which we learn. It's the process by which information is gone all over the place. It's the basic principle of evolution, adaptation, the development of biology, and the functioning brain. This is the learning cycle. You've got some ideas, you vary them, you test them, you throw away the ones that don't work, you keep the ones you do. It's what happens in your computer with your files and your emails. There's all this stuff coming in, you select the ones you want, the delete your ones you don't want. And by doing so, you take a random ensemble of stuff and you create order here because your selection principle has ordered this relative to what there was in the incoming mess of stuff. So it's the basic individual and societal learning, it's the basic source of information. And it's the difference between physics and biology. There, it's almost the difference between physics and biology. The question is, can we think of any processes, physically processes in the natural world, where variation, selection, and deletion takes place? Um, I'll come back to that at the end. There are some places in physics where it happens, but not in the natural world. Okay. The final principle which relates to the last talk that I meant to develop it in slightly different ways, the interaction of the physical and the transcendent. There are eternal, ephemeral, the eternal and ephemeral interact in the physical world. I don't know why I said ephemeral, I shouldn't have said the eternal interacts in the physical world. Eternal laws of physics, what are the laws of physics? They're unchanging patterns of behavior which are the same at all times, all places. They were the same before decoupling in the universe. They will be the same when we will vanish. Many people have commented on this, they're eternal and trans oh, sorry, I should have been eternal and transcendent. They should have been transcendent, interact with the physical world. These eternal laws determine physical outcomes through the material interactions, but the laws of physics are not physical things. They are the abstract basis in some sense which governs how the physical things behave. They're abstract entities which can have physical effects, and they embody eternal realities in the sense that the conservation laws are eternal realities. They hold at all times, all places, and everywhere. Now, the laws of physics is a very... We, we don't know what the nature of the laws of physics is. In a sense, a lot of what we do when we talk about the laws of physics, we're simply naming things. So the moon is held in place by the gravitational force. All you've said is you've given a name to the fact you haven't explained how it is that the Earth here has got a physical grasp on the moon over there. You've just given a name to it. And, but the way which to me is particularly clear is the Platonic mathematical reality. And again, I'm treading on dangerous territory, but I believe strongly in this, that there is a Platonic world of mathematic realities which the human mind explores. It then has effects 
The abstract human theory, such as Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, arise because you explore the mathematical reality. You find some of that mathematics explains the physics, and you can then use that to predict. And so you have got your Maxwell's equations, and you work out, by heavens, this would allow a wave solution. Wait a minute, the wave solution moves at the speed of light. Well, that suggests that light is electricity and magnetism interacting with each other. But wait a minute, that's a particular wavelength. What about other wavelengths? Yes, we can do other wavelengths, and by hope, you can make radios, televisions, cell phones, and all the rest of it. The abstract understanding of Maxwell's theory, and the theory is an abstract thing, leads to the existence of physical objects such as cell phones and all the rest. And so, there are these basic geometrical features, Pythagoras' theorem, there is the number pi, which you can express in all sorts of ways, but we are totally confident that the same will hold everywhere in the universe, all times and all places. In other words, these are transcendent realities, platonic realities, which mathematicians discover. Now, we don't discover these by experiments. You don't say, today I'm going to give you a better value of pi by doing a better experiment, because that's not the way that you do it. You do it by logical argumentation. That's why you get those values. And then you, you, you can check that it works out OK. Because you've got your mathematical idea here of pi does correspond to physical reality. Yes, it does in small enough regions. So I believe strongly that there's this mathematical reality, transcendent, eternal, unchanging, which we learn to explore <coughs> by the way our mind explores it. How does the mind explore it? By pattern recognition capacities of the adaptive brain, which guides brain plasticity. And I think a lot of philosophers rejected the idea of platonic realities because they said there couldn't be any link between a platonic reality and the physical world. But actually, the human brain is the link. And there's a wonderful book by Paul Churchill. Now, I don't always agree with Paul Churchill. In fact, I usually disagree with it. But this book, Plato's Camera, How the Physical Brain Captures the Landscape of Abstract Universals, is a fabulous book showing how the structure of neural networks recognize patterns in such a way that you can do exactly what it says. The physical brain captures the landscape of abstract universals such as the laws of mathematics, laws of logic, laws of computer algorithms, and all sorts of things out there. And so what you have from this viewpoint, and Keddington kinds of hints at this, but he doesn't put it this way, but I believe strongly this is way it is, there are platonic worlds of abstract realities which the mind is able to explore at any particular time. We understand part of that reality, but not all of it, but later we understand more of it. So but we must distinguish what we understand of the reality and the reality of self, and people keep on confusing them. Epistemology and ontology. We understand a growing part of that reality. That reality couldn't care less what we understand and what we don't understand. It is as it is, as it was, as it ever will be. Pythagoras' law remains the same. Pi remains the same. The fact that the square root of 2 is irrational remains the same. And it doesn't care about us and our existence at all. So don't confuse the abstract entities with the physical world. What's the relation between our abstract equation and the physical world? It was kind of mentioned, but I'm going to mention this one again because it's another of these wonderful pieces. Let us examine the kind of knowledge which is handled by exact science. If we search the examination papers in physics and natural philosophy for the more intelligible questions, we come, we come across one beginning something like this. An elephant slides down a grassy hillside. The experienced candidate knows he need not pay much attention to this. It's only put to give an impression of realism. He reads on. The mass of the elephant is two times. Now we're getting down to business. The element fades out of the problem and the mass of two tons takes its place. What exactly is this two tons the real subject matter of the problem? It refers to some property or condition which we value describe as ponderosity occurring in a particular region of the world. We shall not get much further that way. The nature of the external world is inscrutable and we shall only plunge into a quagmire of indescribables. Never mind what the two tons refers to. What is it? How has it actually entered in so definite a way into our experience? Two tons is the reading of a pointer when the elephant was placed upon a weighing machine, which was mentioned here. Let us pass on the slope of the hill is 60 degrees. Now the hillside fades out of the problem and an angle of 60 degrees takes its place. What is 60 degrees? There's no need to struggle with mystical conceptions of direction. 60 degrees is the reading of a plumb line against the divisions of tact. Similarly, for the other data of the problem. 
The softer you in turf on which the elephant slid is replaced by a coefficient of friction, which, though perhaps not directly contributing, is of kindred nature. No doubt there are more roundabout ways used in practice for determining the weights of elephants and the slopes of hills, but these are justified because there's no they get the same results as direct point of view. And so we see that the poetry phase out of the problem, by the time the serious application of exact science begins, we are left dealing only with point of view. If there are any point of reading and equivalents of the machine or scientific calculation, how can we ground out anything but point of readings? But that's just what we do ground out. The question for Germany was to find the time of descent of the elephant, and the answer is point of reading on the second slide of our watch. The triumph of exact science in the foreground problem consists in establishing a numerical connection between the point of reading of the weighing machine in one experiment on the elephant and the point of reading of the watch in another experiment. And when we examine critically other problems of physics, we find this is typical. The whole subject matter of exact science consists of pointer readings and similar indications. In the world of physics, we watch a shadow rock performance of the drama of familiar life. The shadow of my elbow rests on the shadow that is the shadow of ink flows over the shadow paper. It's all symbolic, and as a symbol, the physicist leaves it. Then comes the alchemist, mind, who transmutes the symbols. The sparsely spread nuclear of electric force become a tangible solid. The arrested agitations become the warmth of summer. The octave of ethereal vibrations becomes a gorgeous rainbow. Nor does the alchemy stop here. In the transmuted world, new significance arise, which are scarcely to be traced in the world of symbols, so that it becomes a world of beauty and purpose, and the last suffering and evil. The frank realization that physical science is concerned with the world of shadows is one of the most significant of recent advances. It is difficult to school ourselves to treat the physical world as purely symbolic. We are always relapsing and mixing with the symbols and congruous conceptions taken from the world of consciousness. Untaught by long experience, we stretch a hand to grasp the shadow instead of accepting its shadowy nature. And that is his description and that review I talked about. The pure me mechanists would strive to bring everything within the schedule of pointer readings, beauty, humor, and other intangible qualities. Perceptive Describing our sensations of pleasure to harmonious vibrations of the brain of atoms and electrons, which are constrained to obey the differential equations. Eddington takes issue with this point of view. On one side is a physical word that begins in point of readings and ends in point of reading. On the other, there is a word that is interpreted by consciousness, colored by environment, experience, and prejudice. A world related in some mysterious way to the first, but which cannot be recovered from it. I just love that writing, so that's why I've subjected it to you, because I just think it expresses things in such a beautiful way. Thank you.